Okay, this presentation is going to be uh, building an ideal maintenance program. The reason for maintenance uh, is because whenever you have any type of downtime activities, any type of uh, quality improvements, everything always comes down to maintenance. Um, you have your maintenance in place, you've got a good secure foundation. So we're going to focus on maintenance in this, this presentation because, uh, like I said, it's uh, everything really inevitably comes down to maintenance. Um, you'll re uh, reduce your downtime, uh, increase your, your, your quality. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. And at the end, we'll just recap on this again. Okay, just like in the start of all of the presentations, the uh, you know, just kind of outline the company principles. You want to standardize. Um, come up with procedures, the best way of how to do whatever process it is. Um, this shows how it is done, how it's supposed to be done. And then you have uh, number two, which will be training. Uh, you need to train everyone, make sure they're aware of it. Otherwise, there's uh, a procedure's worthless unless people know about it. Um, this also, when you train, you get everybody on the same page, you synchronize them. This is uh, championship teams. Best corporation in the world, everybody is on the same page. Um, we'll talk about this later when we talk about variable control charts. Um, how variable control charts apply to pretty much every aspect of life. And then number three, to enforce. Um, you know, just like laws. What good are laws if you don't enforce them? Um, I've been in environments before where there's no consistency. Um, employees, operators do not stay on task. Uh, I'm not forced to do so either. So you got to enforce whenever you have uh, policies, you need to train everybody on it and you need to enforce it. Uh, if any of these are missing, obviously it's going to collapse and fall. And this is, makes it very stable. Uh, top left here, there's a stoplight. Uh, standardized, there's no standards. Uh, when you go into a, a company or business and you want to audit them, if there's no standards at all, there's no policies, procedures, you stop right there. And, um, it's an audit failure. They need to have uh, procedures in place. Um, if they do, then you go on number two. Uh, if they train them, they're not trained, but you have procedures or they don't seem like they're trained, you can proceed with caution. And then three, if all three of them are together, then definitely green light. That's a good thing. Good deal. So phase one of uh, building an ideal maintenance system is you're developing a coding system. Um, you'll catch on to this more and more as we go along. Um, first, do your homework. Um, you can type in keywords under Dewey Decimal System, under Control Number, um, Document Number, uh, SKU. Um, uh, there's Smart Numbering, Mapping, etc. So you, you just do your homework, do a lot of word searches or keywords there on Google or whatever search engine you use. And then... Um, you can speak to national parks distributors. That's another thing. Uh, another to pick up a lot of great ideas. Um, there's Applied Industrial, Motion Industries, Granger, McMaster Car, Fastenal, MSC Industrial, and more. So maybe you want to contact some of your uh, your, your international uh, industrial supply places, parks distributors, and pick up some ideas there. These guys have been around for a while, so they they know how to stay pretty organized all their parts and numbering schemes. So next thing you do is get a facility map. And you mark it up. Um, you break it up by departments, and you break it up by production lines, workstations, machines, whatever you want to do. But uh, this is going to be part of your uh, coding system that you're going to develop because it's going to be like a map. And then the three is ID system codes. Uh, all these should match uh, a mapping sequence, just like an address to our homes. It narrows down to location of parts and facility. And you, you want to think ahead of what uh, you will get out of it uh, when reporting. Because uh, I'll explain that in a second here. And then gives the comparisons by department, uh, production line, machine, uh, exam later, you know. So you'll uh, you'll see if, when you export all this information out of uh, the spreadsheets later on or your ports, you're going to have uh, your first number is going to be like uh, the entire plant or the entire company, like a division of the company. And then you're going to have the location or the individual facility. Um, and it goes down even further where it can be even another, the state or the location of that facility and so on. The example I give here is like USA, California, 209, Stockton 31 Channel Drive. So it can be like USA-CA-209-STK-31CH. 
Um, this is just an example, uh, but it's, you want to have it however you set up like a mapping sequence to where it narrows it down to the, uh, the machine itself. And the last numbers are going to be the uh, sequence number. And always keep it within five steps. Okay, for phase two is to gather information. Um, your you know your manufacturer's ID tag is the best thing to go off of. Um, let me see. You create a checklist on every machine. Your assets on site. You divide up area on the production floor. This includes fleet vehicles, uh, material handlers, and all internal uh, maintenance items. Categorize list by pneumatic, hydraulic, you know, electrical, etc. Write the ideal parameters for each category, which you see I have a small check sheet example at the bottom right here. The next page is going to be blown up more. You'll get some ideas off of it, and I'll, I'll go into more detail. You want to catalog all your machines on site and take pictures, especially if they're in ideal running condition right now. Um, one, take pictures because nobody can argue the picture. I mean, they can try, but uh, they're not going to win that argument. Um, it's very great to compare for laters too as well. Um, reason for this is is you, you something's wrong, you don't really know what it is. You can take a picture of the inside of your control panel and you can compare the pictures later on side by side and you'll see something's missing or something's out of place and that really helps pick it up right away, especially if you have uh, some type of joker on site wants to move things around. So after you calorie your machine is gonna picture uh, take a picture of the nameplates. Uh, specifications for obsolete replacements definitely that's going to help later um, pictures of inside control cabinets and pictures of panels because they're small changes over time hard to tell uh, pictures of uh, critical areas that wear down often like where patterns stand out it helps it stand out pictures of gauges uh, differential pressure water pressure hydraulic etc um, definitely uh, that will help as well and especially uh, later when you have somebody replace a gauge that got broke or cracked and you'll see it's not even close to the same type of gauge and that does make a difference later whenever you're trying to uh, troubleshoot see safety guards picture of safety guards and barriers uh, the engineering controls for interlocks like curtains and so on that uh, that help later too as well to make damage stand out and also to prove that you did have it in there or someone comes to visit you have a corporate auditor or somebody and something's missing you're like wait a second that was there not too long ago and you have a picture of it for backup and then overall picture of the machine at a wide angle that really helps too Let's see what else we have here now on the, the next page okay for the uh, machine engineering and safety items that's a little check sheet here um, you can see these are just example names I gave it there's a press machine one two three four or whatever shear machine saw drill lathe conveyor systems and so on and then you'll have, uh, you know, like there's a question of the lines labeled. Um, on the left side column there is what the label is, showing the origin where it's going to. That's the black and white off to the right there. And then uh, if it has the uh, safety label as well, the ones like the for the OSHA, ANSI, and, and ISO labels. Then a job hazard analysis. Does it have a job hazard analysis? And yes or no. And part specs you, know, you have all the part specs these are all these this is just an example make up whatever you want but this is to me is something I use to, to help me to narrow everything down and just become the ideal uh, maintenance procedures that we had it's it, everything kind of fell into place once all these are together troubleshooting you go back and look and you can see what the pressure is supposed to be you have hydraulic uh, as a temperature marked obviously uh, yeah obviously this one's kind of uh, one I made up because a shear machine's hydraulic and definitely way over 100 psi, but air air is about right. Water pressure is yeah, that's about right. A little high on the top, but you get the idea. And so this, you come up with uh, what it's supposed to be. Is it marked? Um, so on. So you get an idea. So for phase three, you're going to build a database. There's two different ways, or actually three different ways you can do this. You're very old school, which is the old uh, composition notebooks. Um, electronic way, where you create folders. Um, or the, the newest, best way is using a, a computerized maintenance management system, CMMS. You'll, I'll get to that. So every inner manufacturer and parts suppliers, yes, you always enter that first um, into the CMMS. The reason why you enter your suppliers or vendors is because you're going to link everything uh, around those and you want to have those in there first. 
Um, you don't really necessarily link anything to your uh, as far. This has been my experience with CMMS systems. It's just um, you always go vendors first, um, and I've dealt with three of them. Two uh, on an occasional basis. The third one was just mainly uh, with uh, old coworkers and colleagues is sharing ideas. Uh, two enter machines, your assets, and link them to the manufacturer suppliers. And then you're going to enter your spare parts third and determine uh, the inventory levels needed uh, by consumption rate plus lead times. And then you categorize your parts by, you know, consumable, spare parts, repairable, you know, part if it can be uh, repaired. And then just give yourself whatever uh, you feel is, is best uh, for your consumables. If it gets replaced every, like every three months or two years, we've had some actually consumables get replaced weekly or monthly, so even faster than that. Um, and there's lubricants also. You're going to enter in lubricants there somewhere. Uh, that's becoming more and more popular now because of all this lab analysis and send them off for samples. The example at the bottom is so you create a folder and you call it Welder 34, whatever the machine is. You break up your subfolders into uh, pneumatic systems, electrical systems, controls, conveyors, uh, scissors and switches, and then lubricants and coolants, and then motors, uh, so on. So you kind of get the idea of your uh, file system. And ne next slide is uh, the same, uh, just another breakdown of how you can navigate your menus. So now your subfolder of pneumatic systems is actually valves and mufflers. Cylinders, uh, air knives and blowers, hoses and lines. These are just examples. And of course, within those other subfolders, the, the smallest ones, you're going to have all the parts in there, part numbers, the specifications of those parts, and some type of a uh, number assigned to it or, or lettering system, a little code to show exactly where it goes. An example of this file, say file 1A, uh, numeral 1, is all the valves for Welder 34. Um, for another subfolder example, lubricants and coolants, and you have your subfolders for that will be pumps, cool tower, coolant fluids, and water systems. Your example for your, your file path, your folder location, would be 1E Roman numeral 4, which is the water lines for Welder 34. So you kind of get the idea of how the coding system links all your subfolders together. Okay, for uh, the best method uh, and for tracking and, and building a database is a new computerized managed management system, so CMMS. Um, the way, the same way as uh, I explained a while ago, you enter your vendors first, then you enter machines, enter your parts, and then you enter your lubricants. You can pause this anytime you'd like and you can take a look and give yourself some ideas. So the first one, this is just an example, some things I threw together just for, for looks. Um, of kind of like a little fake screen here but it's uh, one I made up myself based off of uh, ones I've used in the past and uh, so you have a vendor ID and you have a contact information you have stock capacity transit days specialty is cost compare and payment terms um, pause if you like uh, get an idea you can consult with any type of uh, CMS uh, companies that, that make those um, just some points your vendor ID specific to your area um, and follow coding sequence or can be supplier ID that the accounting department has assigned after a processing term agreements. Um, your assets and your suppliers, yes, you always want to get whenever you're developing a coding system, your accounting department uh, mainly is a controller who's your best reference who will uh, you know, get some numbers from them who they assign to the vendor, to the machines, or the assets, same thing. And uh, get your system down that way. Start, start in that direction. Besides doing all your homework too. Contact information, self-explanatory. Stock capacity, always have parts you need. Are they reliable uh, when needing last minute? Uh, maybe higher cost, but good for emergencies. So that's just uh, some considered to mark down for a vendor rating. Transit, day, uh, transit days, lead times. Specialties, uh, some vendors are good just for motors and bearings um, and have unique parts uh, that are hard to find. This helps categorize them. So specialties. Yeah, electrical and mechanics, it's like, I'd say motion industries is good for bearings. We use them for bearings a lot. Um, applied industrial for, for motor, not motors, but um, uh, valves. Get a lot of valves from them. Um, here locally in, in California, Northern California, we have industrial electric, which is good for motors. Uh, so definitely if you have a motor supply, motor repair place, 
they want to be at the top of your list for your motors. Uh, let's see what was that? Cost compare. What is the average cost uh, compared to other vendors? Are they a higher price? Will they negotiate lower terms? Usually it's your procurement department that gets involved here. But uh, yeah, you definitely uh, have your own database because if procurement's a corporate then, and they're not local or you don't have a local buyer you don't communicate with often, then definitely you want to keep your own information. And then, of course, payment terms is self explanatory. So uh, the next one is the machines and the asset. Uh, categories so you want to have a machine ID which is the uh, same principles as vendor ID fall coding sequence tells you where it is located and uh, what capacity it has again if this has an asset ID number assigned to it from accounting department have your controller give you that number and you should add that into your sequence as well um, description common name specification size weight output etc you definitely want to have the specifications on your description because a lot of these go obsolete pretty fast with technology changing all the time. So uh, this will help you find an equivalent, a comparable model to whatever you're looking for. If yours was to go obsolete, category helps narrow down troubleshooting tools needed, lockout, tagout needed, etc. In um, service date, warranty expiration, PMs due, uh, life expectancy, etc. Yeah, your lockout points. The service day F warranties. Uh, energy sources, lockout, tagout requirements, and number of points will help. PMs, how many preventable maintenance schedules are either linked or required of the machine. You have a weekly, monthly, annual, semi annual, bi monthly, too. Also, there's all different ones. Um, you could do a monthly and weekly together, whatever, click how many. Uh, like I said, this is just an example to my DIS. You can have a parts list, which is self explanatory All these parts are linked to the machine, which is great. Um, that is consistent with a lot of CMMS systems. So you can uh, pull up the machine and see all the parts that are listed to it. Um, or you can even, if it's a universal part, pull up the part itself and see all the machines that it goes to. It works both ways. It's linked both ways. And that's what's good about uh, this type of uh, software program. And of course, if it, uh, an exploded view of the part is always best. Uh, exploded views tell you what parts go to where it's all laid out for you um, it's a visual very visual is really great so um, doesn't leave too much room up for guessing for the next one is your parts detail so just like a part screen um, for your part number it's manufacturer number versus vendor number um, you know you have like say uh, Baldor motors and then you have say um, a MSC industrial supply and each one has their own number um, just like uh, like uh, reef and nester for for like taps and then you have like fast and all which sells the taps or when they have their own so those are just examples description is specification size weight output etc again specification is important um, for whenever they go obsolete which like you know they usually do a lot of times there's parts that uh, or getting hard to find sometimes and especially if you have old machines and it helps you find an equivalent or comparable part classifications mechanical electrical pneumatic lubricant uh, this will help later um, when you run uh, reports and you want to see what's being consumed the most um, but definitely don't make mistakes like I've seen guys in the past who come from um, distribution centers we had one guy who came from Walmart and Amazon distribution centers and he was allowing machines to break down um, over and over instead of finding the root cause just so he can categorize them and then draw a big conclusion where it, what the main uh, um, breakdown or root cause was and, and I kind of got in debate with him and let him know that you know automotive industry that wouldn't fly for one day that'd be horrible I said no you gotta you got the root cause and resolve it right then and I don't know anyway it's if you have someone like that don't do that um, that that's doesn't that's kind of a waste of time and, and a lot of uh, a lot of money there too so machines associated um, all the machines that use the part reason why this is a uh, inner second links to parts so you get the idea um, again yeah this way you can pull up a machine and see uh, or pull up parts see all the machines is linked to but it works both ways vendors first item entered and linked to all machines assets as well as parts so yeah your vendor is going to be there so especially with the cost um, this is really great too 
Yeah, there's a lot of people that negotiate, not negotiate, but they call around asking for quotes all the time. I was required to get quotes almost every single time I ordered. When you can already find out who the lowest person is, call that person, ask them if their price is still good since such and such date. They say yes, and then I order from them. Um, I call around. If I don't, if never called around before, I don't have this information entered. Um, then I'll definitely call around getting quotes from vendors and I'll put all the vendors in there and I'll put their item number, uh, their, their part number specific to them and what their cost is. And then I'll use that lowest vendor uh, for a while. And if I'd say about six months, I'd say, is your price still good? Yes. You know, if they change, I haven't used them in a while, then I'll call again. But normally it's, a, it's the lowest one. Don't call every single time asking for a quote because that is kind of it's a little time consuming and it's a little waste of time especially if it's something very minor so we have vendors yeah life expectancy uh, consumables you know three to months to a year spare part repairable um, this is where you can filter all of your uh, you want to do an analysis later and filter all of your parts by consumables or spare parts or what this kind of helps um, later you're looking to cut costs find something out there like I said technology changes all the time there's always something out there that's new and uh, this uh, might help you. So the next screen is maintenance work orders. Um, for maintenance work orders, this helps you build a history on machines. It helps you build a history on parts ordering. Um, helps you just overall a history in your plant too as well. Um, by what area? That's why you do that coding system by mapping. They show you what area is a lot if you're having downtime. So what you do is, you know, you uh, this is for, for maintenance when they enter in their work orders or just logging it. So you just do a pause it and look at the screen. Um, you have a work order list that's off to the side. And it's color coded to show priority if it's due soon or if it's late or if it uh, hasn't been closed out yet. Um, there's machine asset um, is showing what was being worked on. Um, the, the type of uh, work order, if it's a safety reactive, is a PM. Uh, a QC improvement or just an improvement, a special project, Kaizen, whatever, lean, etc. So that helps you break it down by category too. How many, uh, especially if you report to corporate and they want to see if you guys are keeping up on your improvement activities, you can filter by the improvement and then you can say, hey, these are all things we've done this month. And you know, it looks good, especially if you do the slow, continuous improvements like you're supposed to be doing and not like one giant improvement at once or overhaul or, um, yeah, re overhaul a machine refurbish it at one time or it has to be really old breaking down do something like that anyway so, so classification mechanical electrical pneumatic lubricant another way to uh, categorize it whenever you're running reports to and you want to see if anything stands out maybe there's something missing if say example if you have like a, you have your airline systems you have built and you have on your northeast side of the plant uh, seems to have a lot of air problems then you can that helps you narrow it down to specific areas of the plant that if it's uh, contributing to those those uh, failures or your downtime over there. Failure mode is a uh, preset list of narrowed down common root causes. Uh, that's very a uh, good one there too, especially if you have vandalism or uh, so it would be the same as your almost your categories as well. Parts used or needed, um, link to machine selected, the ones that you parts are used on the machine. This helps keep track of it and all CMS. If you build the system right, what it will do is it will take away from your inventory that you have in there. And then it will give you a flag too if you need to restock your inventory, let you know when you're lower, hit that reorder point. Um, assign employees uh, who, who worked on the uh, machine. So you can uh, assign uh, every employees. And then definitely uh, you have them categorized too for if they're an electrician or fabricator. This helps. Uh, kind of if your guys um, have them hi hire guys to where you have an even number of uh, specialties everybody's in their own little specialty and then you um, so I'm sorry my phone's going off so it's distracting me now but <laughs> anyway um, see uh, and then of course drop down menus are for fast entry no more typing you know, there's minimal typing you know the details or quick note but the direction where everything's headed is, is where you try to get faster and faster to enter all this information in. You want usable data you can you can track and and definitely run reports off of and analyze. But uh, yeah, as more drop downs you have, the better. So that's your work orders. 
So, so far, what all we've done, you have your company policies, procedures in place, you develop your coding system, uh, then you gather information, you have your, you build your database, you built it pretty well, um, now you're on the right track. Now for phase four, you need to get organized. Uh, for getting organized here, I almost lost my spot. Um, what you want to do first, where am I? Shadow boards, okay. So building uh, shadow boards around the plant or facility, um, definitely shadow boards are a very useful tool. Um, before you even, uh, of course, go to uh, purchasing these boards, you're going to have to come up with some check sheets, write one out, make up your own. Um, on your check sheet, you're going to have what the line is or the workstation on, on uh, the left side. And then you're going to have the tools that are needed for specific machines or a machine right there in the middle. And then, uh, yeah, the tools needed, the size of the tool. Um, so you can't just say um, Allen wrench, say which one is. You can't just say Torx wrench, say T20 or whatever. So uh, those are just examples. Um, you have what, how many screwdrivers you need, a big, long. Uh, do you need a utility knife? Do you need chisels? Uh, do you need a pry bar? Do you need one of those pliers? Do you need cutters? Um, anything that, uh, that you need. And actually, you know, for me, I apologize already, I see on my uh, examples to the right here, the shadow board, I have a whole, uh, um, a little, <laughs> a whole set of Allen wrenches. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of over-processing for uh, the, you know, the uh, seven wastes or whatever. That will create downtime already right there. So definitely that's a bad example. So uh, you only want whatever Allen wrench sizes you need, not the whole set. So and Then you have custom-made gauges for, for quality control, whatever that, that workstation or that uh, line, whatever product they're making. Um, and, and another uh, presentation I have on go-no-go no go gauges, I explain how when you design a product, you design go-no-go no go gauges too. All this should be already done, established. If not, get together with your quality engineering department and then come up with some go-no-go no go gauges and then definitely have that in your uh, plan or your checklist for your uh, for your shadow boards. Okay, hammers, you know, pipe wrenches, channel locks, whatever. Um, you know, special made gauges, wrenches, and so on. So you get the idea. And then on your also have a, a floor plan, probably a map mark out locations as this is here in the middle is locations of the shadow boards and then uh, give those assign those uh, a number usually it's by a grid system you have uh, columns uh, one two three four five or rows a b c d or the other way around then you just have an a1 a2 a45 wherever you have to split your plan up by by uh, grids and that always helps so yeah, create the check sheet and list all the tools. Uh, tools only relevant to the machine it is located at or the line. And then uh, QC gauge is also on the boards. Design it first and make it. On the next one for getting organized is your tool crib. You want to organize your tool crib very well. Um, use the 5S principles where you label, you know, there's a place for everything, everything in its place. Um, organized by category, mechanical, electrical, welding, etc., or by machine, there's press, saw, punch, etc. Depends on the, the size of the plant and the specific operations. Yeah, do your homework. Um, you definitely want to uh, get all kinds of ideas, gather information. You don't want to reinvent the wheel, um, otherwise, you're wasting time. Uh, make sure it's easy access. You do an ABC analysis. Um, I have that on another presentation about ABC analysis where you put the parts you use the most or up front or the closest. That way you don't waste time walking to the back every time for a part you use the most. Um, that's like uh, there's too many steps there. Um, transportation and uh, motion is what we call it for the, the waste. That would be motion really. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, definitely have a means to protect it against theft. That's a real biggie. Yeah, anybody who knows has been in the industries for a while that theft is a huge loss in businesses and especially in maintenance too because you got a lot of uh, non uh, non authorized personnel in there and these guys um, you walk in there's an operator in there and, and kind of fidgeting and walks out real quick when you walk in and you're like what were you doing in here you don't belong in here and he said he was looking for something yeah so yeah definitely if you have cameras that's a big plus too. put up some signs maintenance personnel only 
but you definitely want want to have something like that keep production non maintenance personnel out and then of course map document locations quantities and categories uh, electronic spreadsheet uh, your software program or CMMS or a hard copy logs the old old school way for the next on your tool crib organization you want to have what's called like um, order cards uh, trigger points or Kanbans whatever terms you want to use um, these are some that I designed a while back um, I kind of combined a couple uh, Kanbans from the automotive industry and then a fastener supply I think it's Fastenal maybe that uh, I use one of their examples and I kind of combine them together to make make our own so feel free to pause this and uh, you know look at them I'll maybe throw in a couple of the slides I have them on another presentation too um, yeah I kind of color code the outside of them um, based off the categories that really helps too uh, mechanical electrical pneumatic hydraulic water cooling systems fasteners lubricants um, you know, safety office supplies that's you know outside the maintenance area but uh, you kind of get the point here for final on your site organization is a site plan or improvement plan you want to outline um, all of your electrical panel locations air and water line systems uh, safety maps fire protection fine spaces and PPE uh, and so on you got lighting maps uh, network maps where you keep the ladders and roots and more um, the best way this is an example on this one slide I'll insert some pictures here that will probably be blurry you won't be able to see it that well but you get the idea um, because the maps are huge I'm trying to do a screenshot make them small and then turn them into an image where you can see it so uh, you pretty much gray out everything in the background and you bring those to light and you send out the little call outs the labels for them that's the best that uh, for every single map you can make maps for everything once you have your overall facility map you can use AutoCAD um, what else is out there uh, Visio Visio is what I use a lot um, in the past because yeah it's uh, what we had you know so whatever you don't have to spend too much money on all this even CAD is not that expensive anymore but depends on how many users you have if it's still the same so anyway you get the idea for organization there's a lot to be organized here and I'm going to just I'll be flashing these pictures across some examples before I start the next one all right phase five if you're ready for this point uh, you have your company policies in place you have a coding system you've already developed you have your check sheet you have every uh, every machine in the plants been cataloged all of your parts have been cataloged I mean it's an extensive process um, you're starting to build your database uh, you're getting organized you have all your information or all your uh, areas organized and now uh, you're going to revise and improve your preventive maintenance schedules. Um, so this is uh, for phase five revising PMs. Um, the reason for this is, of course, uh, guys have been in the industry for a while know that uh, you start out usually using the manufacturer suggested PMs and then you solely adjust them and revise them as you go along to match your operations. Um, there's a lot of unforeseen circumstances or unforeseen uh, measures that you miss. And a lot of it comes out of quality problems, comes out of uh, scrap, it comes out of, you know, have machine improvements, machine modifications, um, even refurbish the machine, you have to start over. So there's a lot uh, during daily operations that happens that over time that you're going to have to revise your PMs to keep up with it as well. And, and during your, your host and Connery or your, uh, your accountability room meetings, whatever meetings you have, your reports you got to submit, if you do, you're supposed to, you should be doing that anyway. Um, you definitely want, uh, it's like an 80-20 or 75-25 versus reactive maintenance. You definitely want PMs to be on the higher scale. Uh, I know guys are 70-30. You know, whatever works, whatever you targets you set at, it actually depends on your operations, how busy you are, how, how long you run, what your environment is. I mean, you definitely you're not environmentally controlled. You're going to have more problems than environmentally controlled uh, atmosphere. Um, Let's see, you have equipment manufacturer says PMs to start, then modified. You have to meet your operations. Then you have parts manufacturer suppliers come visit and they give input. Yeah, that's a good one too. Uh, we've had uh, ITW, GEMA, and and Norks and in a powder coating uh, in, you know, industry where they come and the guys they look and they they've been all over. You know, they go to plants everywhere, so they see ideas at other facilities and they'll give you ideas yourself. And um, it's great to share ideas, pick their brains when they're there. I can do this again. 
Uh, where was I? Okay, have my raw material reps come visit and get input. Same thing. These guys that uh, that supply to other facilities exactly like yours, they have great ideas. Pick their brains. Um, swap ideas. You know, say, hey, what do you use for this? Or what have you seen the best practices for this one? And, and you keep doing that and you stay diligent. Pretty soon, you're the guy who everybody's going to be talking about. You're the guy who's going to be the best practice guy. So, and you're going to start coming up with ideas. It's just a... Uh, you know what's the saying? You know what? What uh, you force yourself to do it, then it becomes a habit, and then it just comes natural to you. And I mean that's very true. Um, then on your PMs also, you might want to categorize your your PMs and, and prioritize. Um, example, I say the first item. I got a couple examples in this next slide too. I'll show, but like safety, you always list it first. Um, lock out, tag out, test all safety guards, like curtains, interlocks, proximity sensors, etc. Uh, remove and re, uh, repaint any damage guards. Um, replace any warning labels. Replace any control panel button labels of illegible, illegible, excuse me, and uh, etc. That's OSHA required stuff. There, you definitely want to stay on top of that. And, and your PM is the best way to, to catch it. Stay on top of it. Um, I had something else for safety. Oh, a lot of times I have the guys I'll put down on the work orders to uh, clean up the area first or spray down. That way any leaks stand out. If you're having leaks come from somewhere, clean that general area. That way it stands out where it's coming from, if it's not obvious anyway. Um, so electrical, um, you know, oxidation on connectors. Usually if you have oxidation buildup or what, you know, uh, it's a pretty old or high humid environment. Um, testing the currents, you test to the grounding. Um, conduit status, you know, if it's, uh, make sure all the conduit's good. Uh, junction box covers, knockout plugs must be in place, another OSHA thing. All systems using uh, this power source, so uh, you get the idea. These are just examples. Mechanical brackets, belts, motors, sprockets, gears, bearings, etc. All in good order, grease, etc. Yeah. So, um, basically it's one giant checklist. I mean, this is categorized to make it easier, especially if he has a testing, uh, bag with them because your guys are supposed to have that you're supposed to be doing a lot of testing here especially if you have uh like um air ducts and, and you have fans and dust collectors and bag houses yeah they got to test that airflow so that's why they have a little bag with them temperature check you know a thermal imager is really great too where was it? um a pneumatic so there's air cylinders clamps ejectors presses etc hoses blowers yeah that's another category everything's categorized um, hydraulic, the hoses, you know, make sure it has a good arch. You know, there's a, there is actually a study that was done on hydraulic hoses as far as having a good bow to it, the ideal bow. And so you want to look into that if you haven't heard and, and check your hoses and make sure they're all, uh, have that good arc to them. Arch, excuse me. Uh, engages, accuracy and mark, make sure they are marked by the parameters. Uh, and then, of course, if you have uh, tanks, you know, of course, hydraulic tank, make sure it has like the little level line, you have it marked out, the fill line. Um, water, um, check the conductivity of the water, temperature checks of the water. Uh, if you have cooling systems, uh, definitely you want to have like a limit for that. It gets bad if your cooling tower or cooling system is going bad, your chiller or whatever, um, that's what the temperature checks is for. Uh, make sure you set your limits. Find out what the limit is on yours, the best one, and make sure it doesn't go above that. Um, total dissolved solids, TDS check. Um, make sure your meter is working and so on. So, yeah. And uh, check all your, your reservoirs if you have them. And then, of course, clean up afterwards. And the, your TPMs, no MPs. TPMs, what we used to call it, uh, total productive maintenance or total preventive maintenance. OMP, operator maintenance program, is what another uh, I've heard others use. Um, so, yeah, and definitely I'll, I'll get into that later. Those are just basic startup checks for operators. And then actually maintenance should put that together for production side. They should be the ones that should outline those basic. And that's just... Checking for spills, checking for loose bolts, fasteners, checking for loose brackets, um, spills, you know, clean up spills. Let me go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, okay, so these are just example, and it shows the categories. Uh, it's the, your safety, your electrical, your um, you know, mechanical, and I don't know if pneumatics on there or not. I don't, you'd actually have to look uh, closer and this or blow it up. I don't remember what machines these were for. And then there's a semi-annual one with a, a, a diagram, making sure everything's, uh, you know, hooked up the right way. We've actually had a lot of situations where, uh, I don't know how this happens, where guys have actually had things hooked up backwards. 
um, I don't even know how it ran, but yeah, we have machines that run, and uh, yeah, they had lines that were hooked up backwards. Uh, some guy was rigging it, I guess, to keep it running. You know, and production is in a hurry. Um, that's the sad thing, though. You know, and production wants to keep running, keep running, and have no downtime at all. And if you do anything to help production out and you know, like rig something, it's going to come back at you, and then it's like you're the bad guy for saving the day. But uh, you get the point. Um, so these are preventive maintenance. You're going to revise your preventive maintenance and uh, go on to the next one. Okay, uh, phase six is uh, downtime reduction activities. So now that you have your policies procedures in place, you've built your database, um, you've organized your tool crib in the plant, you've taken care of uh, the necessities up until now, and now you're going to put in some uh, work orders or come up with some downtime reduction activities. Um, this first one here is just uh, an example of a spec sheet that goes in your SOP binders on the line side. Um, if you don't have an SOP binder, it needs to get, you need to get one. Uh, get with production, safety, quality, everybody, because all those sections go in there. And uh, make sure you have an SOP binder. Everything relevant to that machine and to that line needs to go in there. <clears throat> this, this spec sheet here, um, you're going to list your top 10 consumables with part numbers. You should have a pretty good idea. If you haven't been uh, collecting data up until now or you just recently started, um, just off the top of your head, your mechanics know uh, what's used the most. The only only time when uh, using information off the top of your head is whenever there's management decisions for uh, investments. And saying the machine breaks down a lot doesn't fly because you know, you're going to invest a lot of money into refurbishing it or, or rebuilding it or replacing it. So... Uh, we have an idea of what the parts are that you use, or you at least have an order history you can go off of uh, to show uh, what you order the most. List that down. Um, yeah, get an exploded view of the machine. Uh, get one from your vendors, from the manufacturer. Look it up online. Everything's online these days, so it, it shouldn't be too hard. Um, if not, contact your, your vendor or a company that makes them and see if you can get somebody to get some drawings or make it yourself. You know, you take pictures or get components of each one and, and put them in certain positions and just try to do the best you can to, to make it or just take a picture then of the machine itself and do little call outs uh, if you need to. You can do it in Microsoft Excel or some other program. Uh, you list the tools are needed and the sizes for each common area so the, the size of say example the Allen wrench or the Torx T20 or whatever um, that you need and then have that listed as well. Um, that helps prepare what goes where. You can have, say, three Allen wrenches or three um, regular wrenches up on the on the board there. And, um, what size you need for that particular uh, change out you're going to do uh, should have listed on your spec sheet. That really helps. And you're having it narrowed down, too. <coughs> Let's see what else. Uh, company branding and these spec sheets, yeah, there's, you can use that. Is which the colors and the formats. Um, on the sheets for consistency, consistency with everything in the plant. Um, have that listed. And then, of course, potential hazards and the PPE required uh, can be listed on there, too. These are optional. These are just example formats that are listed here. The next slide is just uh, some ideas for uh, uh, downtime activities, reduction of downtime. Um, you have uh, quick change tools, obviously. Um, you want to get away from a regular nuts and bolts and go to either the wide head or the wing nuts. Some that's really fast you can use and don't even really need tools for. Uh, you have clamps that are quick release now uh, with wing nuts on them. You can see them on the right. You know That's definitely a useful tool uh, in certain applications anyway. Um, your carts, um, even modifying tool carts and all that, you put bigger wheels on them. Uh, helps them uh, move faster and smoother. Um, you'd be surprised at how much faster you move when you have a cart that's really easy to slide on the floor. Um, your gauges, you know, you mark out your gauges, mark all the parameters out. Uh, your your bad areas, what's too low, what's you're getting in the yellow area. So you, that one's to me is, is a best practice having it marked where it's, you can at least have your uh, your boundary areas, your critical areas where you hit the uh, the failures. So that gives you time to hurry up and, and replace some or schedule some downtime or um, put on your PMs. 
that's one of the first things you need to do is replace that or fix whatever the problem is. And then, of course, you have the other uh, type of gauge or markings where you just uh, the range itself is just marked. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, nuts, the wing nuts, Allen wrenches, T heads, you use those instead of they're easier to turn, faster to turn. If you do have Allen wrenches, and, and if they're located in areas that are really hard to get to, they're tight, then uh, you need to stick a wrench in there or, or a screwdriver in there. Make sure it's something that's easy and fast to turn. Even your screwdrivers, you have T heads or um, you have the kind that uh, the fit with quick change with ratchets too. Um, let me see. Make it easier to see when temperatures and pressures are getting too high or low. Uh, mark that's when you mark parameters. Yeah. Um, hard to reach areas. Custom tools definitely. Uh, we've we've made some custom tools ourselves a lot. Some funny looking wrenches, but it works. So when you do changeovers and uh, these are ideas. And of course, there's the SMED, which leads into the single minute ex uh, exchange of the dies. Uh, that's something that's, that's very popular, and uh, I could probably go into a lot on that. But usually, it's uh, conveyors or flow racks uh, for the dies, you know, machine components. Some where you have everything right there. Uh, you use a lot of tools, um, you know, leverage tools to uh, swap them out if you do have dies at your facility. Um, and on notifications, that's the bottom there. Little and on uh, light and little control board, control panel, where you gotta turn it on. Uh, you can install those around the plant too as well. That that really helps notify someone right away. There's there's something that needs to be addressed. Get right on it, so that avoids the waiting. So that helps uh, reduce your downtime. And there's much much more. There's like a lot of activities. So uh, so now uh, phase uh, I think six is where we're at now. So that's downtime reduction activities and then we're going to the next alright uh, so for phase seven building a winning team uh, you might think this is something you should have uh, from the get-go but um, this whole presentation is built on the assumption that you already have your operations in place you already have your staff in place what this is is uh, building the winners the the guys that uh, the few that are going to replace the 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 other guys that are just uh, not exactly team players, but aren't really keeping up or uh, um, seems like they got their own thing going on the time. Uh, they're there to put in their time and leave. So what this does, i uh, give an example of, of my own experience here. After personally training all the guys, putting me all these measures in place, we're going to go over here. Uh, we had about seven or eight mechanics, and uh, we ended up with just two. Uh, exact same production hours, exact same, uh, everything ran the same. Uh, the only thing is that these guys, uh, they are great fabricators or electricians. They, they all the all the training was in place. I um, mean, really built them up, and uh, I really would encourage having a little, too little staff. Uh, you do that, you know, machine to mechanic ratio is something you also do when when it comes to, uh, um, you know, for um, Analyzing for manpower you need. Um, there's another word I'm looking for. I can't think of right now, but it's uh, it was something we used to do back in the automotive industry, or uh, um, machine mechanic ratio. Uh, it's something where you do to make sure you have enough guys in place. And uh, definitely uh, maintenance is insurance. Your mechanics are insurance. Uh, don't really want to replace all those, uh, but you, when you do have guys that are really on standby all day long. Um, Kind of like firefighters, you know, that's basically what they are. Um, you got to come up with activities to keep them busy a lot. And, and there's only so many, uh, so much activities you can do. Uh, and like I said, though, and there's guys through certain experiences, one or the other, where guys have moved on to other jobs or they've been terminated. And your your top producers, they keep rising and rising and they rise above all the others. and That's what you end up with. And if you don't end up with that, here's a way to recruit some or to get some guys in place that are like that to uh, get you to where you have uh, the perfect staff, the, the perfect team. So, um, so now you're going to focus on building a winning team. Um, what you should do is when you get your resumes, these are just some techniques we do. Um, you can filter the resumes. This is a little uh, picture off to the side here. It's kind of a cheesy picture of a, of a filter, but kind of get the idea. Um, it's get other perspectives as well. Uh, inevitably, it's going to be the, the direct supervisor's uh, choice, though. Um, there's nothing more annoying, and I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of other industries, but 
where uh, you upper management or HR hires somebody and says, I got a new employee for you. Um, you know, I go, really? You know, and you really want to, if that person reports to you, you want to be the person to make the decision to hire them on, uh, not anybody else. Because, uh, granted, you might still like this person to get along with them really well, but you want to make that choice because it's your employee. So, um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, you can have HR review the resumes. There are sometimes they want to have minimum qualifications, which uh, can be um, unrealistic, especially if uh, HR or uh, someone in corporate writes the job description or the requirements, and they put down a bachelor's degree for maintenance, and, yeah, that, that's crazy. Uh, even uh, our Department of Defense and military even states on all their job postings that uh, education level will not replace uh, experience. Experience is the priority, the key. And, and definitely, if you have a good um, system in place, which we're going to go over here uh, for training, um, your uh, you know your merit scale, your your raises and everything, and, and definitely. Uh, you have the right measures in place you don't really need all that you're, you're gonna build these guys and what you're looking for is work ethic so um, so you're gonna filter resumes you know just get other perspectives you know then where it comes down to us uh, as the final candidates yeah I'm mean, gonna recruit winners um, do not listen to what they can do see what they have done that's really important um, you want to hear of things that they've accomplished uh, these guys that say they can do those are just promises and you're not gonna hire somebody on promises um, you place in team scenarios like on big projects. Do they say I a lot? That's a good one too. Um, an example there is you have a guy and one of your top mechanics in the room with you during the interview, and you say we're gonna give you a scenario. You tell them that uh, we're all we're on a project, you know, all three of us, and you're you're gonna be the the lead on the project. And we gotta come up with a way. You know, you can do one of those smed things. You know, or we're going to have to reduce the downtime on this die changeover or whatever. And um, how would you do that? How would you tackle that? And then, uh, you know, instead of delegating or what, they'll say, well, I'll do this, I do that, I do this, I do that. And, and you and your, you know, you and your head mechanic are looking at each other. And, and uh, you say, well, you know, you kind of say I there about 30 something times, you know, and you don't say anything about what we're, what are we going to do? You know, and, so I definitely make sure they have uh, that team outlook, and they're definitely team players. Um, and also, where do they come from? What's their background? They come from a small business, or they teachable? Um, you know, like are they an empty cup? Because um, like they can have a director or VP title, and they come from a small business with only one location, and yeah, they really don't have much experience there at all. So even with the big title, they might have <clears throat> core values. Um, some that can't be taught develops over time. Yeah, core values are something, you know, it's uh, something that uh, becomes a habit and then becomes natural to a person. So, and their work ethic is one of them. Uh, definitely, you want somebody with great work ethic. So, uh, you, what I do is I ask for questions as far as, uh, give me an example of your, your days. What is What do you do here? Give me an example of a, a full day, a good productive day. And then, uh, sense of duty is, is a good one. Make sure you have a good sense of duty. Uh, very honest. You definitely want that. And then, yeah, team players. They know how uh, teamwork is. You can even ask them. Give me, give me what your outlook is on, on uh, team. Being a team. What does being a team mean to you? You know, open-ended questions. Then uh, test for winning characteristics. You know, place in scenarios where they run into cost of obstacles, opportunities. The way you look at it, positive anyway. And uh, see if they find a way to get get the task done or give up. You know, that, that's that's always a good one too. Um, you know, you're on your way to uh, work and you get a flat tire. What do you do? You know, do you call your supervisor right away say I'm running late because it's flat or do you not go in? Say your car breaks down uh, you're, you, and you don't really know exactly what it is yet. Uh, do you get a ride real quick? Do you have a tow to the house? How do you react? How do you, you get things done? You jump on it, take care of it, get back on the road. You know, that's the type of guys you're looking for. Guys who have that winning characteristic that uh, will not give up uh, in the slightest, uh, slightest obstacle. Um, slightest speed bump, whatever you want to call it, you know, they, which they view as a, you, you're going to teach them later to see those as opportunities and then uh, get back on it and get on the road. You definitely want your guys to be the best. Uh, clear career path, salary cap, and then incentives. Um, these are where you set your ground rules. So um, you never should make uh, raises mandatory. 
Um, they should follow a point scale like in the write-ups, which we'll get to also. Uh, definitely want positive reinforcement where you get incentives for great ideas to help save money. That always helps because we got guys that, that they're feeding, like the two guys we have, you know, they they were the ones who always did this. Well, I said, hey, you know, if we uh, you reduce this cylinder down by two inches, you know, it uh, save a lot of damage and get broke. We keep replacing it every four to six months. And you're like, okay, well, you start researching it and you find the filter there, excuse me, the cylinder they're talking about. And uh, you put it in there and you never replace it again. You know, after a couple of years, you're like, wow, you're right. You know, and so, uh, and yeah, filters, they, you know, they say this is the wrong type of filter we're using on this one. We need this type of filter. And uh, you know, guys, you have guys go out of the way to research themselves or at least give you feedback to where, enough feedback where you can research it. And definitely, uh, yeah, it's like the whole plant just runs now. It, you have a, you, you start getting more time <laughs> more time on your hands and you just start looking for more just uh, well, that's a good thing though um, you have uh, you know a fraction of the staff yet the plant runs a lot faster and longer it's just, yeah you'll it, implement all this and you'll you'll see what I'm saying so the setting the ground rules and expectations that's a biggie because uh, yeah company policies laid out and understood uh, training and disciplinary procedures in place um, all this happens in the interview and during the probationary period because uh, you definitely if you don't set the ground rules um, you don't want to leave anything up to chance or from guesswork and you might have a problem employee or, or employee becomes a problem when uh, that can even look at yourself could be your own fault the way uh, you start out your relation with them so and then conditioning employees all on the same page with training um, again, you know, we're all conditioned ourselves, you know, the, how we're taught and with our experiences in life and conditioning employees, the same thing. You want everybody on the, on the same page because championship teams, uh, great organizations, everybody is on the same page. Everybody's at the same pace and uh, you move slowly, which brings me to the next page here or slide is uh, measuring progress and training. And uh, the bottom there is a variable control chart, which we'll talk about that in a second here too. Variable control charts, though, are uh, you can apply those to anything in uh, in life and help reduce any type of problems or uh, issues, any type of downtime, anything. I'll, we'll talk about that later. So here you can pause it, take a look. Um, these are just some training card examples, little funny ones put together here to. Just kind of give you an idea. You, you can have four levels or more. Uh, the top one there, Uncle Sam, is six. The bottom, we got Mark five. He's uh, he's four. Four is very common. Four is the ones I like. Um, you get a picture of the employee and you stick it on this badge, and you have magnets on the back of it, and you have it you have it stuck up there on a board in the maintenance area. Um, usually, as guys are in, guys are out. Um, so you have on the top, you say these guys are on, on right now, and this guy's on this line, this guy's on that line. You have the little magnetic board out there with all these stuck on there. And I should have took a picture, but uh, I can't really give away too many trade secrets, but it's get the idea. Besides, leaves room for a book later. <laughs> so progressive steps, you have zero, which uh, is a, a blank one, which means no knowledge of subject matter, or they don't have any knowledge of really of... Uh, this outline which actually I believe is on the next slide anyway I bring in more detail um, one is beginner level he's a trainee uh, two he works under supervision 80 90 percent at target or on target um, what that is is targets is like your uh, efficiencies it's what you set um, give me an example is uh, you know it takes an hour to mow your lawn and you have these guys that that hire or pay what do you call it uh, Charged by the hour to mow your lawn, and uh, I apologize. Background noise messing me up here. Um, and you have a guy who's trying to charge you for two and a half hours to mow your lawn, and uh, you know it only takes an hour. That is so. Knowing your targets helps you from getting taken advantage of. So you definitely want to set your targets. You don't want a guy work on a machine for five hours when you know it only takes uh, one or two. Doing PMs on a machine, you know you. This this is the biggie here. Eighty nine percent of target. So he he's about eighty percent of say three hours to do a PM on a machine. Uh, when he starts getting uh, down more and more, and he's he's right under three hours on doing this PM. He's at at a hundred percent. So you just set that target, and he meets that target. Um, 
yeah, a little side note here to uh, company policy once mechanic reaches top level no more uh, raises unless it's cost of living you know never so often now it's all positive reinforcement ideas they come up with uh, to save uh, company money you, you condition them to be this way uh, yeah to think this way so that's uh, really important like I said you're you're building your team and you want them all thinking alike you all want them on the same page and it definitely will work out for you and you definitely measure that progress as well when you have the reviews you bring all this up and I believe I'm getting into that still so the vault the variable control chart basically variable control chart is, is a example if you say speed limits um, you have from 30 miles an hour up to 60 miles an hour and your target range is um, 40 to 50 and he, when you have guys driving uh, 30 miles an hour, guys driving 60 miles an hour, you, you're more likely to have accidents than when they're all driving the same. I have the red circle there basically to show the ideal range of what you're looking for is get everybody in the same target area. So if this was all your staff and, and these were all your, uh, say, jobs your guys were doing and the time it took them to do those jobs and they all, they all take about two hours to do or whatever and you have uh, guys that are all over the place then you're definitely off target and you want to get all your guys on the same level and say hopefully that makes sense your the top red lines your upper specification limit the lower red lines your lower specification limit and uh, your target range right in there so uh, look up variable control charts give you a good idea so on the next slide here for training um, I blew it up a little bit on the badges so you have mechanic principles um, you come up with all this material yourself and when you come up with this material and the training material you do it like slides like I have here and you can see I do have a little theme going on with the, the branding with our, our A2 Development Corp and with our underwater stuff we got going so it it kind of gives you a good uh, it sets the pace it's, it's branding it's formatting color schemes it's uh, team pride um, definitely um, something that you build over time and, and it gets everybody in there and on the same page and it's consistency which is really great so you have mechanic principles, like I said, you'd use the same formatting, whatever your color scheme is, uh, branding, uh, on your train material. You have uh, electrical, safety, splicing, you know, like I said, come up with your own material. Um, you can use other material that's already out there, it's just more effective when you use your own. It's uh, builds, I, I'd say, I feel it builds more pride and, um, other guys, it's just more of like a te overall team and atmosphere with all this bearings hydraulics mechanical drives um, pneumatics and cylinders same thing pretty much couplings and alignment uh, rigging confined space training welding um, you know you got your ox, ox cutters uh, blueprints drawings fabrication tooling uh, your of course your CMS your work reporting PM planning, scheduling, forklift certified, lockout, tagout authorized, uh, first aid CPR certified. So these are just some categories you can have on the training, uh, your training material, and then of course you judge your your guys by your measure them um, based on their performance. You can set your targets and they see how they meet those targets, and this is how you rate them. And you definitely need to have a, a way to measure your guys because if you don't. Um, just leave it a chance. Uh, you don't want to leave anything up to question, or you want everything to be solid and in place. Because when it comes time for disciplinary action or for raises, uh, you don't want to have anything be under question. Uh, guys will know. Um, let's see your uh, other training categories like air. You have your air pressures, uh, FRLs, leaks, which are your FRLs. What filter regulator leaks? I mean uh, uh, lubricants, line lubricant, and then you have leaks. Um, Water systems, pressure, uh, total dissolved solids, and conductivity. Um, that's definitely you want in your uh, training material. Mechanical gears, bearings, belts, brackets, fasteners, etc. Yeah, it's all mechanical. Um, coolants and lubricants. Um, longevity. I think I, I don't know if I mentioned already, but you know that's lubricants is like the new thing uh, where everybody's jumping on as far as SMED goes too, um, where you're sending off your samples to a lab like annually uh, or semi-annually depending on how much you run and uh, they do an oil analysis to break down your machine you know your lubricant uh, breakdown as well and it's kind of neat um, I don't want to advertise for too many people but I use test oils who I'm very familiar with and who I use so um, 
testing and measuring yeah, definitely uh, how to test machines when they do their PMs um, that's another part of your training program and then a project planning as well for downtime activities you know downtime reduction activities um, some examples of training material like fasteners right there off the side all different types of fasteners and then uh, I don't even know I have a, the others drilling and what, lubricants and sealants and yeah testing so getting everybody on the same page on right, um, the next one is uh, enforcing now uh, when you have like a checklist of uh, assignments when you give to your guys you assign task um, you write down basically this is just an example little check sheet I had I used um, I actually think I reduced some of it I cut the guys names out of it but uh, you can see uh, basically what task is um, little notes what type of priority scale it has with the deadline and definitely whenever you assign tasks or you delegate you definitely put a deadline to it um, if you don't put a deadline to it basically you're just you're it's not really effective because then the guy can do it just any time then it's never going to get done so you can definitely got to sign sign a priority to it and sign a deadline a date those are really important and make sure it's clear directions what you want done um, and the cost implement that's mainly for upper management they want to know uh, how much money we're spending on this activity and how much money we're going to save in the long run so you definitely want to uh, you know keep a keep a record of all that especially they're going to ask you later if it's a capex too they're definitely going to want all that um, and trust but verify you know down here at the bottom um, yeah I trust my guys but you still need to verify keep yourself safe too and cover because if you get questioned you're going to need to know how to answer that okay on the next one is also again it's holding and enforcing now this one is actually your employee folders keeping record of your guys um, you definitely you hold them accountable um, you it separates the dedicated employees from those that are just passing time and you mentioned that already um, a working folder is what we call it um, this is something I've gone all the way back to the telecommunication industry a long time ago that I used to do um, where it actually is something HR coached me into doing and, and had me start it and then uh, I've been using it ever since it's a pretty good tool so um, you keep electronic files or, or hard, hard copy folders in the same actually because your write-ups with signatures you're obviously going to keep on hard copies but you scan them in too and keep them in their, their electronic folder that way when you don't have to go walking pull all this big old folder out um, you have everything right there on your desktop you do reviews and stuff or even write-ups um, so there's a, a track notes uh, time or note times you mentioned uh, work corrections needed um, yeah, that goes in there like a little log sheet. Um, you can do that in Excel. You write down the date and the time that you mentioned something. If it's a poor performance, a, you know, or something wasn't done, um, or something was rigged or done halfway and had to be redone by one of your top guys. Um, so there's a lot of things guys do out there that they're even reporting work and, and you go and it wasn't done, but we'll get to that. Um, so you list all the times the employee did not uh, complete tasks or work hard. Uh, our work had to be redone. There you go. Redone. Yeah, that's what I just mentioned. So, list all times tardy and absent. That everything is in there in their little. Uh, that's their, what's called the working folder. So you have this little log you keep of all their uh, times you spoke to them because uh, it's important to have this log. And like I said, days and times important. Um, the area you're talking about, the machine specific you might be talking about, the parts you're talking about, and so on. So. Uh, Whenever it comes down to performance issues and you're given a verbal warning, a verbal warning should always come with an employee improvement plan. Uh, this is actually an outline specifically of what they need to do to improve, because um, things are going downhill now, and you need to, you got to say, hey, you need to pick things up, and this gives them a clear view of what they're doing wrong and what they need to do to improve. You're, this really needs to be clear to them, you know. And so you go over all information in the working folder, what led up to this moment. Then you outline expectations on an, in, in the improvement plan. And have employees sign copy of the plan. You know a documented verbal warning. You know so this isn't a write up. It's just a documented verbal warning. It, that's a joke we we went back and forth with HR over a few times a while back. But that's what HR called it. Documented verbal warning. So whatever. Uh, keep in working folder and then and then employee file as well. You know, like I said, if you can. Uh, have them sign the sheet and then scan it in. Keep the scan copy in the electronic folder. That way you don't have to go walk into the file cabinet when it comes time for uh, write-ups or any type of disciplinary action or even performances. You know, but uh, for good performance reviews, it's uh, these 
should be in there anyway. So now it comes time for write-ups. Um, written warning specifically mentioning company policy violation. Yeah, you definitely want to call it exactly what it was. Uh, should have a scale to go by, non-bias, example one. Uh, one offense every blank is a point. Um, tardy or early out, half point. Uh, let's see, horseplay is half point. Absence is a point. Uh, insubordination is five points. Yeah, insubordination is a biggie. And usually just somebody, if they're having a bad day, you don't take it personal, but um, management rule number one, sleep on it. You know, it's just really hard sometimes, but try to walk away and, and sleep on it and then uh, dress it the next day. Um, you find them in the restroom again for the 10th time of the day after warning, uh, after warning is blank points. On cell phone at workstation is two points, etc. So those are just some examples. You know, HR might have an issue with uh, you telling a guy he's going to the bathroom too much, but if you told him he goes ten times in a day for a total of three hours, uh, then HR will say, "Okay, I see your point." They'll be on board with you. So you got to do specific times because <laughs> it adds up. Suspension when you get to this level. One to three days at discretion, or whatever. If it reaches this point within blank weeks, uh, employee is already on way to be terminated. Yeah, you get to the point where you're suspending somebody, it, it's pretty much over. But uh, you just let them know, you know, if there's still hope for you, you know. But uh, you know, I usually tell them, I said, you know, if it gets to this point, um, it's not looking good. So we'll see what we can do, turn things around. Uh, termination, um, with all the steps above. Um, termination should be well expected and reduce the chances of employee resistance or retaliation. Um, I just give you some examples uh, from past experiences. Guys, they already know it's coming. They already know it. And it they even say, yeah, I know. You know, when you come up and you, you talk to them, say, yeah, <laughs> I, I got to talk to you for a second. Like, yeah, I know. So, I mean, they see it coming. Um, so, off to the right here is just an example of the folders. You got their name. You know, my little joke of Cor Kirby Morgan. You know, it's little joke uh, training and then performance so you have training is all their training records which is positive showing how well they're uh, developing and then you have performance which shows if they're doing good or not good so and so on so just to close it off finish all this your uh, your metrics actually that's phase uh, phase eight will be uh, measuring all your progress how do you measure all this um, Companies where we've had JD Power Awards, I've worked companies we've had JD Power Awards for years. Um, so best quality, um, and this is automotive industry. I'll even say it's Trim Masters. Come from there. Uh, these are also the Toyota Engineering Manufacturing Association um, audit uh, guidelines, or you know that all that a lot of this stuff comes from. Uh, I actually, well, I don't know if I have any sheets or not, but. Anyway, so this is how you measure for success. How do you know this is successful? Um, you know, how do you measure progress on improvements? Well, you capture data. Before you start this activity, you can um, measure all your downtime. If you have records or you're keeping some type of log on your downtime, your parts ordering and all that, um, then downtime due to maintenance activity decreases. Um, parts ordering and spending decreases. And then uh, machine breakdown decreases and the product quality and scrap due to machine uh, failures improves. So there's lots of ways you can measure you'll see before and after. And like I said earlier, you know, if you have a, a large maintenance staff and all of a sudden you have a fraction of the staff but yet you're still running at full capacity the same as you were back then, then I mean that's a good indication too. Your guys are doing great and you got a good winning team in place. Um, all these measures come together and uh, definitely uh, Anybody ask you any questions, you can pull it up right there at the tip of your fingers, you know. Um, so if there's any questions, you know, you want to, uh, you know, have some type of questions, I don't check it really that often, but uh, you can go a2develop.corp at gmail.com. Um, I don't know if the website probably still isn't up yet. That's been getting put off for a while, but hopefully it might be up soon. Um, this is actually a side activity for the uh, company purpose, a nonprofit. Um, but anyway, get the idea. Um, hopefully it helps you out.